Hey guys, welcome to Button Adventures Fitness, Boxing, and Farming Goat Therapy. With all the constant confusion in the mainstream media about what a healthy lifestyle is like, our main goal here at Button Adventures is about making health fun and easy for you. I'm Coach Lita. I have a background with a Bachelor of Sciences in Nursing, as well as experience in geriatric and mental geriatric mental health and long-term care. My boxing career consisted of 45 amateur boxing fights, winning the Canadian Light Welterweight Golden Gloves Championship in 2013, and a record of one and one as a professional fighter. Then in 2017, I was voted Fab Female Health and Wellness Entrepreneur of the Year in Greater Toronto Area. Now as a coach full-time for the last eight years, and a proud goat mom of 11 and soon to be 12, Nigerian dwarf goats, I specialize in animal therapy, Parkinson's, and women who are university educated over the age of 30 years rediscover their previous athletic youthfulness through boxing so that they can decrease their pain while increasing their energy, focus, confidence, and courage to go after their dreams. Welcome to the weekly goat vlog. Why goat? You may ask. Well, I grew up on a 300 acre farm with cows and horses and there is huge and hard to maintain. Kind of like the information overload in our society about what is healthy and what isn't healthy. Goat, however, is great little small lumps of kind of like rabbit turds. Make it easy to clean up and fertilize your garden with. Then as a boxer and fighter with 45 amateur fights and one-on-one -on -one as a professional, when I trained and visualized my success, in my mind, I was always the goat, the greatest of all time. When you box to be a winner, you have to tap into this mentality. But being a goat does not mean you have to get into a ring and put the gloves on to fight. It's about using the tips from the goat blog to sprinkle inspiration, motivation, and insight to use in your own life. That's my goal here with Button Adventures goat blog to give you that digestible fertilizer to grow your own greatest of all time mindset. So make sure you hit our like and follow button on Instagram and Facebook and smash, smash that subscribe button on YouTube. So today's special guest, as if you can't tell, I'm super excited, is Benjamin Stetcher. So Benjamin Stetcher was born in Nairobi, Kenya, but grew up just outside Toronto, Canada. He studied history and philosophy at the University of Guelph, but as soon as he graduated, he took off and spent most of the next decade living and working in East Asia as an education consultant. All that changed when, at 29 years old, Benjamin was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. The promising future he had been building towards suddenly faded and was replaced by a gloomy fog of uncertainty and despair. As his disease progressed, he realized that he needed to come back home to learn how to better manage his disease. But as he started visiting labs and attending conferences, he soon found himself enthralled by the rampant pace at which biomedical science has progressed in the 21st century. He spent the next couple of years traveling the world visiting research centers and pharmaceutical companies to learn from the top minds in the field all that he could about this disease and what therapies were on the horizon. He now speaks regularly at academic centers and biotech companies on issues related to neurodegenerative diseases, research advocacy, and healthcare. He's also the founder of Tomorrow Edition and a patient advisor to several organizations, including the Toronto Western Hospital Movement Disorder Clinic and Rune Labs, a San Francisco-based brain tech company where he chairs their patient advisory board. He's also written a book along with Professor Alberto Espe and published by Cambridge University Press titled Brain Fables, as well as the forthcoming Reprogramming the Brain with Alfonso Fasano published by Springer Publishing. Ben has been invited to speak at a number, a variety of very famous events throughout the world, one which includes Chan, Zuck Chan Zuckerberg's initiative, Neurodegeneration Challenge Networking Meeting. So Ben, 
Thank you so much for being here today. This is um, when I was, when you sent this biography over to me and I was looking at it, I was like, where are we going to start? Because I mean, when I met you, how many years ago in 2016, you're interesting character then, and you've done so much, so much for the Parkinson's world and advocacy um, that I will try to keep it here in the next 45 minutes, but I'm not going to lie, viewers, you're probably, we're probably going to go over an hour here today. So buckle in. So Ben, thank you so much for, for being here today and sharing your vast knowledge that's going to uncover here. Thank you, Veda. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all that you're doing as well. I mean, without professionals like yourself working to help people like me, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. I know a lot of patients, they wouldn't be able to continue living the kind of life that they want to live. So first off, I just want to say thank you very much for being who you are and doing all that you're trying to do to help people like myself. You're very welcome. It's been a it's been a blast. <laughs> Eight and a half years. And it's only gonna get more fun. <laughs> awesome. Good to hear. So can you let us know a little bit more? Like let's let's go back to the beginning a little bit and the why when you were first diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's. Sure. So I was about 29 years old at the time. I didn't really know anything about this disease or neurodegenerative diseases in general. My only two reference points were Michael J. Fox and Muhammad Ali. Mm. Um, so I thought, okay, maybe I can get to know a little bit about this disease. I started to look at some of the, like I, I did some cursory searches online for Parkinson's. I saw, I found the picture of the old guy who's like hunched over and he's like got a cane or whatever. I thought, okay, that doesn't really look like me. That's not what I'm experiencing. So I, so I continued to search. I continued to look and I found, I started to look into the research as well. I delved as deep as I possibly could into all the science, all the research. And I found that um, actually my background, because I have a pretty good background in languages as well. I found that was actually my most helpful skill in trying to understand some of the neuroscience, some of the research going on in this field. Um, I eventually got myself to the point where I was able to understand the papers. I started to write some of them myself. And I started to contact scientists and researchers all around the globe, trying to see what the latest and greatest in this field is. However, I soon found out this clinical label that they have, that they have called Parkinson's disease doesn't really exist in the real world. I mean, it's, a, it's an umbrella term that captures a, a wide variety of different experiences, different people. I think there's about 50 different symptoms that are fall under this umbrella. Each one of us gets a different combination of symptoms, about four or five, six different symptoms. And each one of them progresses at different rates, different times, different speeds. So I thought, okay, how the hell is anybody ever going to make sense of all this? Well, I guess I kind of concluded along the way that the only person that's ever going to make sense of your disease is you. Yeah. No one is going to do all that work for you. Go back to try to figure out what's wrong with you and figure out what the best solution is to help you live your life as best as possible. You have to do it yourself, unfortunately. Um, it takes a lot of time, a lot of planning, a lot of like trials and tribulations that you're going to go through. But there's nobody else that's going to do everything that is needed for you. The people that are going to help, like like Lita, people will help you along the way. But at the end, I mean, you have really have to master your own disease um, if you're actually going to make the kind of progress that is needed to live as good a life as you possibly can. That's amazing. Um, I love, I love that you just unpacked. Um, when I have like new people that come to me and they're asking about the rock study and it's the best thing that you can do for yourself is like take control of it right away because it, it's not going anywhere. And that's the only thing that you can control for yourself is what you can do for yourself. So it's amazing. You just unpack that in like three or four minutes. I should say that I've gotten a lot of help along the way. I'm, I'm also a very privileged position in a lot of different ways. One of the biggest ones that I'm here in Toronto where I've accessed some of the best clinic, clinical minds in the world. People like Dr. Alfonso Bazzano, Tony Lang. I mean, those people have helped me immensely. I don't want to downplay what they've done for me either. But at the end of the day, it really has to come down to the individual, the individual taking onus upon themselves, trying to understand the disease as best possible and figure out for themselves what's the best, what's the best therapies, what's the best lifestyle adjustments they need to make, what kind of nutrition do they, they need, how much exercise are they going to get. So nobody's going to be able to do that all of that work for you. You have to be able to do it by yourself. And the sad reality is that not a lot of patients are able to do all of those things by themselves, but you have to be able to just managing what you can in the time that you have. And that's all that we're doing here with, with this thing that we have called life. It's about yeah. trying to live it as best as possible. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so you have done a ton of research, like a ton. 
um, and, and the books, like the book, uh, how did you start to unpack that? Like, it kind of seems like it was a little bit from an outside perspective, like a bit of a rabbit hole. Like, you know, you, you started getting interested and like unraveling and then you have more questions and more questions and more questions, like kind of walk us through a little bit of that procedure besides the fact that you started doing the research, you know? Well, at the end of the day, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm, well, I'm a hyper curious kind of individual. So I'm, and I, I'm also stubborn in that, like, unless somebody can like point me and like show me exactly what they're working on show me exactly what it is that they're talking about, I'm not really going to believe them. Um, so like one of the first words that came up when I searched for Parkinson's was this word called alpha synuclein. Mm. protein that unfolds in weird ways in the brains of people with Parkinson's. However, I, I, I went from one research to the next. I asked like a thousand different questions. I tried to figure out what exactly is alpha synuclein. How do you know this is happening to me? Mm -hmm. Nobody can actually tell you whether or not it's happening in your brain. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we have some scans right now that do show some promises that maybe there is something wrong there. However, all of those things are just binary outcomes. Like, there's a new biological rating system for Parkinson's. I don't know if you've... But essentially, all that does is show you whether or not you have this thing called alpha synuclein pathology. But again, I mean, as soon as you like break down those words and you try to like delve into what they actually mean and what they mean in the minds of researchers, you soon start to realize that they apply to like these broad ranges of people, but nothing is actually specifically about you as an individual. So that's that's the kind of the conclusion that I led to again and again and again. Everyone, yeah. every researcher, they're studying these populations of people, but nobody's studying what's wrong with you. Um, however, I should say that there is one person. Not one, but there's a team of people in Cincinnati. Uh, so I wrote my first book. It was called Brain Fables with Alberto Espe. He set up a program in Cincinnati called the Cincinnati Cohort Biomarker Program, CCBP for short. You can go to ccbpstudy.com if you want to learn more. But that program is the only one that I think that I found in the world that's really trying to figure out what's wrong with each individual that comes into his clinic. He gets rid of all the labels. He, he doesn't look at Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or dementia or any of those things. He just looked at the individual that's in front of him and he tries to figure out what, what's wrong with this one individual person. Um, and it's kind of a corny cliche, but if you can save one person, you can save the whole world. Um, and he really embodies that kind of mentality, that kind of thinking, that kind of like profound insight that I think I wish most more researchers had, more doctors had as well. Wow. Sorry, that was a lot of tangents, a lot of different directions, but yeah. No, that's amazing. It's patient, patient advocacy, right? Like, cause my background is in nursing. So it's always about patient advocacy, about education, awareness, and the individual experience and how you advocate um, for your patient and for themselves, which is what you're, you're talking about. So can you say that it's ccbp.com? ccbpstudy.com. ccb as in Bob, p as in Peter, study.com. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll put that in the links after the, the interview. We're done live here. Amazing. Okay, so how did you, um, like, what has kept you motivated and inspired to keep going down this rap hole and to keep doing these books? Because, I mean, uh, for the viewers that are not aware of kind of Parkinson's, it's like when you, sometimes when you take on a lot of things, it can be a little more stressful and it can be hard to, to manage more so with Parkinson's. So I, I, I want to know, like, have you ever found it like the motivation and inspiration kind of waxed or waned to do that? Like, was it low or like high end, you know, kind of take me down that journey. Cause there's a lot. Yeah, There are definitely moments where I feel like all this work I'm doing, it's not leading to any results. But then, like, as soon as I go out into the world and I see, like, either people, either patients or researchers or scientists that have been influenced by the work that I've been doing and have maybe changed their direction with the researching or, like, a patient's doing something new because of some recommendation that I made a long time ago, that's what fulfills me. That 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 tells me that I'm on the right track. It tells me that I've been doing something right with my life. Um, but yeah, it's really been that kind of, like, feedback, that motivation, that, that, that kind of feedback gives me more motivation than anything else ever has. I can't tell you, like even just two days ago, I was at Queen's University at Kingston. I was invited by a, a teacher there. Her name is Susan Boink. I don't know if I pronounce her last name. Boinky, I think. Okay. But she invited me. She's a great person. Like She invited me. She gave me 
an hour and a half to talk to her class of 40, 40 fourth year students that are all about to go into med school or, or brain tech health of wow. some kind. Yeah. So she gave me like an hour and a half to talk to them about whatever I wanted to talk to them about. Like I really, it was like an open floor, open book kind of presentation. Where I really gave them like the, well, my, I told them my journey. I answered all of their questions. It was that exchange, that back and forth, that really like drove home. It's just another like reminder to me that what I'm doing is making a difference in some people's lives. And, and yeah, I mean, at the end, that, that's what I wanted to do from the beginning, even before I had Parkinson's. When I was a teacher back in East Asia. That, that was something that always drove me, that always inspired me, that ability to like touch another person's life and, and impact it in some way or another, and impact it in a positive way. There's nothing else that I want to do with my life. So I'm going to hopefully be able to continue doing this for as long as I possibly can. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that a little story. It's amazing. Thank Did you. you have a, yeah. would you like to share a specific example on how sharing your story and your research and uh, interacting? Cause you, 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 I can't, I, I probably would have read off for 10 minutes, all the speak <laughs> places that you have spoken at like you are well sought after in this world so thank you so much for being here today but like to share and divulge your your information is there one specific time that really stood out in your life besides like talking with the medical students well yeah it was actually the first kind of talk I ever gave on this bigger journey that I've been on I think it was 2000 it was my first talk at a medical center Oh, wow. So I know you said it, said it but, but whatever. Uh, it was at McGill University. I was invited there by a professor there named Zivgan Orr. He actually, I, I, I don't know how, but I convinced him somehow that I, I've been doing this for a long time. Don't worry. He gave me five hours to talk to his kids. That's like all the students that were there. So for five hours, I was giving a presentation. Uh, it's online. You can view it if you want to search for my name and McGill, uh, Parkinson's presentation, something like that. It's on YouTube as well. But that, but I, from that first talk, I, I got so much feedback. I got so much like positive reinforcement that I just need to keep on going. And each talk has kind of led to more talks. Like there's always somebody in the audience who is inspired by something, something that I said. So they invite me to come speak at this next place and this next place. And that's really how this whole thing is, has, has snowballed uh, yeah. to the point where it is now. Where I can just like go almost anywhere. The, like I've been like literally almost everywhere in the world except for South America, I think. I've been out to East Asia, I've been out to uh, maybe not Africa as well. Africa, Africa and South America are my last two pieces that I'm trying to add to this stone. But all over Europe, all over North America, I've been, you name it, I've been there probably. If it has anything to do with Parkinson's, I've probably been, probably spoken at that uh, either biotech company or academic center or medical hub right now. I'm hoping to be able to keep on going and I think I can. For a little while longer, anyway, because of this new adapt. I don't know how much you want to get into this, but it's a kind yeah. of adaptive deep brain simulator that I've had implanted yeah. about three years ago. Yeah. So, um, not everybody is familiar with what we we call it in the Parkinson's world DBS, deep brain um, simulation. Um, it's a. Did you want to explain your your journey, like, because I can. I think it'd be better from your first first world first perspective, first person perspective. So like I said, I was diagnosed at 29. At the time, my symptoms were pretty mild. I had like a tremor and uh, some bradykinesia and some dystonia. Bradykinesia, sorry for those who don't know. It's like a slowness of movement where like you reach for things like this. Blah, blah, blah. Dystonia is like when you're you have a cramping in your hand or your muscles, and you get like a claw. Like it's hard to ungrasp that. But the reason why I'm able to do that now, where I'm able to kind of live my life more freely, is because of this deep brain stimulator that I hadn't planted almost three years ago. Just going back a little bit more. Seven years ago, I met a guy at Toronto Western Hospital. His name is Dr. Alfonso Pizzano. He's a neurologist there. He's also a movement disorder specialist. He also happens to be one of the world experts in deep brain simulation therapy. Okay. Um, he agreed to take me on as a patient of his. And I've been kind of riding this journey with him ever since. About four years ago, though, we started talking about when I would get this deep brain simulator implanted in me. Um, I got it implanted in June, I believe, of 2021. I'm not mistaken, it was right around there. And I'm happy to talk about the surgery and go into as many gory details as you want, but I don't want to gross it out too much. But um, suffice to say that so six inches through both hemispheres of my brain, there are these electrodes that have been implanted by my surgeon. They got connected to wires through tunnel around my head, through my neck, 
I don't know if you can see that right there, but that that that's not a vein, that's a wire. Okay. And there's a battery right there. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can move a little bit closer and show you guys what that looks like as well. That battery, though, is what allows me to live my life again, do things I want to do. And just to give you some illustration of how much it's helped me, I used to take about one pill every seven hours, or every three hours, sorry. Every two to three hours, I need to take one more levodopa pill, send that pill, in order to feel like more or less like myself. Mm -hmm. um, I can talk about those on-off fluctuations that patients are always writing, but mine were so extreme at that point that I had like maybe one hour cumulative time per day that I felt like I could like do kind of the work that I need to do for that day. Um, so it was at that point that I decided to go forward with this deep brain simulator that we'd been talking about before. Um, however, mine is a newer kind from Medtronic. It's called this new adaptive version of deep brain simulation. The older ones are called these continuous versions, but mine, what it's doing is that it, it can measure something called the beta waves that are that are in deep in my brain. And it takes that signal and it uses that signal to help decide how much uh, amplitude to give my simulation throughout the day. Um, it, it sounds maybe a little bit sci-fi, but it's another yeah, no. reason why I was, yeah, well, well, I, I'm a big sci-fi fan. <laughs> so that was appealing to me in that regard. But yeah, I was kind of jumping all over the place there too. I don't know exactly. No, where to go no, that's that. that's a great, great explanation. And um, I mean, it's a very because I've been specializing in Parkinson's during the daytime for the last eight and a half years. Uh, deep brain stimula stimulation is a very personal personal choice for each person who's diagnosed with Parkinson's, and not everybody goes through it, and not everybody has. Um, effective success with it. So thank you for sharing like the exact specifics of, of your journey and what your system's like with it. Thank you. And I should add that like Lita was mentioning, it's not for everybody either. You need a specific set of symptoms and you need you need a lot of different uh you need a good uh, you need a lot of different things in place just to be eligible to even get deep brain simulation. You need, you need to live relatively close to one of the centers that offers it. You also need a good surgeon, obviously, and you're a very good programmer, somebody who knows you're, you personally, and you need a good family environment to come home to at the end of the day. I mean, because like there's, there's weeks on end there where I was kind of like immobilized by this, there by, by getting this thing implanted in me. And so it's very important to have all those different things in place. But Lita, I actually have a couple of questions for you. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm usually an open book. I'm currently writing my book. Book. <laughs> What's your question? So before and after a patient tends to get DBS, okay. what kind of exercises do you recommend that they do? And then like, is there, how, how does the program change for them after they get DBS usually, if there is a usual? Are you talking specifically about like personal training or are you talking about the Rocksteady program? Personal training, but then also we can talk about this later, but also nutrition wise as well. I mean, do you find that these pa these patients who go through DBS, um, what works more, better for them before and afterwards, before and after getting the procedure? Does that make sense? It does make sense. I have a little bit of experience with it, but not too much. So I'm not the most knowledgeable person to uh, give my perspective, you know, but I think because it's been a very subjective experience, um, you know, like it is recommended to look at the gut brain health. Uh, that's what's had a lot of effectiveness, even without the DBS is the, the gut health. Um, and like looking at cleaner eating, intermittent fasting, um, the high intensity exercise. But I think with what I've read and what I've seen, it's the balance, right? Um, working on that, balance that as well. That yeah. Lately, my balance is a bit off because of this deep brain simulator. Maybe it's because of Parkinson's. Nobody really knows what the cause is, but um, at this point it is what it is and you just gotta find a way to live with it as best as you possibly can. Yeah, and try to focus on, on. I mean, that's what we do in the Rock Study pro program. Like the boxing itself is all based on, based on balance and based on um, big movements and loud movements that help offset everything. But balance is the number one, number one thing because increased risk for falls and everything, right? So. I've, I've said this to some friends of mine, though, but I would love to live in a gym like the one behind you, because like I, I feel like you need to be in a place where you're not afraid to fall, or you can just fall on mats, um, and everything's padded and cushioned, and everything's and also the big the bigger spaces tend to be better as well yes. for me, anyways. 
Yes. And um, to, to bring it a little bit to that point, just briefly, is that a lot of people with Parkinson's um, can have this symptom called freezing. And what happens is like in smaller, tighter spaces, it can bring that on. So bigger open spaces often allow people to have less freezing. So um, it's interesting that you, you mentioned the big spaces, but learning how to fall safely is really, really important when you're, you're living with a disease like Parkinson's that puts you at an increased risk for fall. So Definitely is. I fall maybe once a week now, um, but I, I find myself actually leaning on the, so when I was a kid, you can see right here, but I don't know. Uh, so when I was a, not a kid, I was like 22 years old. I went off to South Korea for a year, for three years, sorry, to teach English. But while I was there, I also went black belt in Taekwondo. And through that Taekwondo program that I was in, I learned how to fall continuously. Hey. Um, and so that's something that I'm leaning on right now. Like every time I fall, I'm able to like, I haven't hurt myself yet because of that, I would say, um, because I know how to okay, fall. I mean, it's not yay that you're falling. That's not, but yay that you know how to fall properly. Yes. I know how to roll as well. Like I know how to, I know how to fall. So, so yeah. yeah. Um, so if anyone is young enough and like able to do it, I would try and find a Taekwondo gym as well. So it'll teach you the best ways to fall. This way it's like keel over as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that little perspective. So, what has been your three toughest obstacles throughout this journey? And do you have specific goals that you're working on throughout this journey? Or is it just, you know, it's kind of like, I'm going to come back to that rabbit hole, like where there's this research and this, this connection and that connection and this talk. Um, or do you kind of have a little bit of a vision of how you're doing this? Um, I do. I think, I think, as time goes on, it becomes a little bit more solid, but it's hard because I don't really like claim to have all the answers either. Um, especially when it comes to disease like Parkinson's, I think, um, but yeah, I, I just don't want to like come off as somebody who knows everything about this disease. I know a lot about what I specifically have going wrong in my brain, mm -hmm. but I don't know a lot about what's happening in another patient's brain or body or health wise as well. Cause there's so much individual variability when it comes to this disease that it's really hard to extrapolate from one person to the next. Um, but I can tell you like more about what I think is going wrong inside of my head if you want. Sure, so it's called... absolutely. It's fascinating. <laughs> I have a more kind of quote unquote pure form of this disease. I can tell that by my symptoms. Like my main symptoms are tremor, uh, dystonia, and uh, bradykinesia. Mm. A lot of patients though, tremor is not one of the things that bothers them the most, even though they might display it. So I have like cognitive issues that they have, gut issues like you were talking about before. So like uh, the amount of symptoms is kind of like mind boggling by itself, but, 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 but yeah, so mine is more of a pure form of Parkinson's, something called nigro striatal degeneration. Um, there's a part of my brain between the, ni the nigral area, which is like the darker area that you see in some of the pictures that you might be able to post later on. Or if you just look for Parkinson's disease online, you'll see that there's a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. It's a darker part of your brain. Uh, that's why it's called the nigral area. So the nigral striatum is like the connections between the, these two small parts of your brain that are deep, deep, deep inside. So it seems like that part has degenerated pretty profoundly in me. Um, the hope is that it won't spread too far beyond that area, but we'll see what happens over time. But because I know that I have that kind of more pure form, that's why DBS was so beneficial for me. Because mm -hmm. it's right there in the nigral striatal pathway. That's where the, this electrode has been implanted in me. A part of my brain called the STN, the subthalamic nucleus, which sits like almost between those two different pathways. And it's been able to re, so it's kickstarted that pathway and that's how, why it's working so well for me. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to go into more detail if you want, but I don't know how much more detail that you have. You're, you're that's, that's, right. uh, that's, that's a really, really good. And then you, you touched on earlier too, um, the procedure and everything. Yes. So that's you, I think you've really, really given a good, um, like I always think of things from like a coaching perspective is like, how do you make it? So it's, it's, it's simple for everybody to understand, right. Cause not everybody like right. using right. Latin right. terms, right. medical right. terminology is, um, yeah. it can be confusing for a lot of people, you know, like glutamus maximus, well, it's your ass, you know, <laughs> Exactly. If they want, though, I can show them some pictures as well from 
lot from the surgery itself. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Sure that... Did you want, I'll share, can you share the screen? Yeah, I can share my screen. Give me one second okay. just to load up the pictures and then I want to talk for a bit, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious what the, the top three, like you've had a lot of, like you've traveled all over, you've talked all over. Um, is there three specific highlights throughout this journey? Like, would it be the book? So that's definitely one of the highlights is being able to okay. write books like books like this one that I've written with Alfonso Vazano. Yeah, I went and to order yeah. it and I realized yeah. it wasn't it wasn't available yet. And I was like, ah. <laughs> yeah, you got to wait one more month, I think, and then this one will be available. But you can get my first book right now if you want. It's called Brain Fables. I wrote that one with Alberto Espe. Those two books have definitely been two of the highlights of my journey so far. I'm getting to work with these kinds of brilliant doctors and getting to like know a lot of the scientists and a lot personally getting to know, like, hear their stories, hear what the, hear what bothers them, hear their troubles. That's been a very enlightening part of this journey for me. I'm gonna quickly take you through this presentation if you want as well. This is actually yeah. the same presentation I did to the to the kids at Queens uh, a few days ago. But first, I talked a little bit about what is Parkinson's, like what part of the brain it affects, and that kind of thing. Uh, the symptoms and blah, blah, blah. Then I walked them through my journey quickly. I won't do the full thing here, but we'll do a quick version of that right now. Yes. This is my, that, that's my grandfather in the back right there. This picture's taken, I think, in 1921, something like that. Um, the reason why I, I showed them this picture, though, is because I was trying to explain how, because these are med these are kids that are about to go into medical school. Mm -hmm. How would you explain Parkinson's disease or deep brain stimulation to somebody like this? That was a question that I asked them. It stumped them for a bit, but eventually they had some pretty cool answers to that question. That's a good question. Yeah. And this is from Kenya. This is where I was born, Nairobi, Kenya. That's me as a baby. I came back there thirty years later on. Then I started my advocacy journey. I, I, this is actually from that first talk at McGill that I talk, told you about before. Then I talked about getting this deep brain stimulator implanted in me. This is right after I came back from the hospital. Blah, blah, blah. Then I talked a little bit more broadly about some of the problems that we face as like I'm trying to tackle this thing called Parkinson's disease. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Talk about this specific problem, about how do we actually try and treat individual people versus populations of people. Yeah. This quote, this graph actually does a good job of summarizing some of the reasons why we need to focus more on individuals rather than populations of people. Um, yes. Basically, the point of that is that, like, this is what ha this is the result of almost every study that you've ever that ever just gets done in Parkinson's or any kind of neurodegenerative disease. However, those dots, almost none that line in the middle is the result of the study. It's a result that almost none of the dots, the individuals, falls on. Hmm. There's another huge issue is access to care. How can we actually treat all the people properly that have their diagnosed with Parkinson's? I mean, we don't have the kind of neurologist that we don't have the kind of system in place right now that will allow us to actually better care for all the people that are going to be diagnosed. Yeah, I definitely, I don't know if you're going to keep diving into that, but that's definitely something I want to dive into a little bit more because that was the main, one of the main things reading your stuff. I was just like, yes, because you need that person who is advocating for the individual on every level of, of obstacles that you have to get to the care, right? And the multidisciplinary team is not very cohesive at all in the system. Yeah, and this picture by Sarah Regeer, it sums it up much better than I ever could about the problem that we actually are facing here. How do we actually think about, how can we actually continuously help these individuals that are diagnosed? Well, one way is through new technology like this Apple Watch from a company called Rune Labs. I work very closely with them. We're actually hoping this year to open up in Canada. So soon enough, Canadians will be able to benefit from everything that we're trying to do. Beautiful. You can look more into them if you want. I'm happy to speak more about them as well. Rune Labs, find them at runelabs.io. Um, but yeah, this is a huge issue that is not properly addressed. We're far, far, far from a good solution to this problem. How can we equitably give out care to people? Like, how, how can we make sure that everyone gets the same kind of care that I got? Mm -hmm. It's a problem that I don't have a good answer to right now. But I think if we collectively put our minds together, I think we can come up with better solutions than we currently have. Yeah. Um, this Muhammad Ali, I, I yeah. use this as just a reference point. I talked about him before. To me, this is what this thing has really done for me, though. This is what deep brain simulation is for me. So that's me playing with my niece and my nephew in my house. Um, it's allowed me to play again. It's allowed me to be free. It's allowed me to live my life and do the things I want to do with my life. Before DBS, I couldn't have imagined having this moment with my niece and nephew. But afterwards, I was able to. And yeah, 
this is why we do what we're doing so that more people hopefully can live this the kind of life quality, and be the quality free. of life it's it's beautiful yeah exactly precisely Blah, blah, blah. how effective can DVS be? So this is my on, I think your, your audience might be familiar with these on off fluctuation pa patients experience. This is how it went down for me after I had DBS. I'm not cured by the way. I, I, I can't say this is a cure quite yet, but it's the best therapy that's out there um, for people like myself who have the specific disorder that I have. And this is the, how effective it was for me. Now this next part, I need to warn some of your audience, if they are listening, to, they might want to get a little bit squeamish right now because I'm going to show them a picture next of what, of, from in the operating room of, deep, of getting this deep brain simulator implanted in me. Um, and just so you know, don't feel too bad, but uh, I actually had two pre-medical students faint. Oh. Uh, not at the South South in Queens, but in my past, I've had so far two people have fainted because they have this neck picture I'm going to show them. So that's so one thing to keep in mind is I was awake for this entire procedure as well. That you can see my eyes and my here my eyes. So, my so eyes. they cover you, they cover your face from the front and you're awake. Yes. Are they get, are supplying oxygen? No, there's no oxygen, but you do have like a mild sedative in your hand. Okay. It's important that you're awake for the whole thing. Okay. I have a question for you, Lita. Maybe oh. you can <laughs> I didn't realize I was in the hot seat today, but go back go. <laughs> um so don't, don't worry too much if you don't get this right, but whatever. What do you think would be the most traumatic part of this actual, there of getting this deep brain stimulator implanted? In your mind, what do you think is the worst part about this whole procedure? I think the sounds. Very good. No one at Queens was able to get that, so, so good job. I'm a nurse. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's actually the sound of getting that, going through the skull. That was the worst part for me. Hmm. The sound, like, like usually sound is created because your air because your ear picks up sound in the air coming around you. First time in my life where sound was coming from the inside of my head out. Um, wow. It's like nothing else I've ever experienced before. It's like nothing else I hope to experience, but yeah, but it was. A lot of patients will go through a lot of trauma. Then I talked a little bit about some of the other options that I had available to me at the time. That gene therapy, focus ultrasound, deep brain stimulation, and cellular placement therapies. Um, okay. I talked a little bit about what each one meant and what each one was. Happy to go through them if you want, but I don't know how interested you are in some of these. Um, I will say though that the unfortunate part and why access to care is so important is because most patients they only have access to one of these therapies, so they kind of get pushed into whichever one is closest to them. I had access to all of them, so like I said, I'm a very lucky patient. But it's very important that most more patients have more equitable access to all of these different options, so they can best decide what's going to help them at the end of this day. Here are all the trials involved for Parkinson's as well, which kind of complicates things because, like, you always just wait and yeah. think maybe something else will work for, for me. Yeah. And and that is something that I have picked up on when we have our support group meetings is that there are a lot of options and there's a lot of trials that you know, they're always looking for participants. Um, You know, which, which do you choose? Like, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't want to say that it's very invasive. Like, I guess it depends on whichever trial, but how do you make that choice for yourself with everything that's going on? Yeah, exactly. And then how do you actually do it to the point where like, you can feel confident talking to your doctors about this and they can feel confident talking to you mm. um, again, but that's why it's so important to become an advocate. Um, Cause that's really the only, only option that I see anyway. That, that was the only reason why I was able to more effectively make that decision. Because I knew about the results of the cell replacement therapy trials. I knew the results of some of the gene therapy trials and the focus ultrasound trials. Mm -hmm. It was because I had access to all that kind of information that gave that allowed me to make the right decision for me. Most patients, they don't have is, that kind of access. This is right. what you're going to condense in your book? Or you have condensed yes, in your yes. book? Okay. Yes, that'll be in the new book as well. Then I go. Th I went through the three pills of DBS. Like these are the three things that I think if you don't have each one of these three things, you probably should not be considered for deep brain stimulation therapy. Mm -hmm. That first thing there is a good surgeon. You need to have somebody who knows you very well. But that's more important is that you have somebody. That's that's Kalia, doctor. That's my surgeon. Okay. Doctor Sunil Kalia. I love him to death as well. 
most important thing though that he was able to do for me is that he he has the, the insight to say i don't know from time to time ah. um, yeah yeah also i love i was loving question after question on him, even during the surgery he he was able to tell me sometimes to shut up when he needed to do some work yeah second pillar there is your family you must have a good home environment to come home to you also need a lot of psychological support along the way so my uncle there in the middle of my parents he was able to give me like three of them were able to give me all the support that I need to get through this journey as best I possibly could. And finally, good programmer, that's Alfonso and me and his parents in his hometown of Nusco, Italy. Ooh. Um, yeah, I took a trip out there. That's where we wrote the book. We we mostly writing for this for the new book out in his parents' home in Nusco. It was a beautiful place, beautiful location. Um, I can't thank him enough though for helping get me through, getting me to where I am today. Next video is wondering about the recovery. Kind of looks like this. So this is me before two days before my surgery. That's me waking up in the hospital room right afterwards. Mm -hmm. Then uh, then that's me back home. And then I got the staples taken out, I think, 14 days after the surgery, something like that. Here's a quick video that I showed the kids as well. Uh, if you're just sort of interested, if you want, you can go on YouTube though and just and search for it. Um, I can play it a quick movie. This is from yeah. a few highlights from the first programming session that I took part in. Okay, so he's working on your balance and gait right now, assessing yeah, yeah. it? Yes, exactly. Okay. You'll see in a minute, though, what happens the first time we turned on this device, like how instant the therapy was as well. So that's me just trying to walk normally. I can walk it off. I can really do much at the time. I was really off all medication. Yeah. So that is a common symptom for those who are watching. I just turned it on. You turn it you on. See how much stiller, how much calmer I became. But I also noticed something else. And that is I lost I lost a lot of weight before getting DBS. I gained okay. a lot since as well. Okay. Uh, because of he, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. You're I think you're gonna answer that question. Yes, yeah, so Parkinson's what it does is it puts you in like a constant state where you're either like constantly tremoring or constantly very dyskinetic. Dyskinetic just like these writhing motions where you can't even sit still. So you're like throughout the day, you're constantly burning up energy. So you're trying to eat more and more and more food, but you can't eat too much because then it competes with the medications for absorption. So yeah. The medication is often protein. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. So that's why I lost so much weight before I had the surgery as well. And that's why I've gained so much since. Well, I gained a little bit too much, but whatever. It's another story for another day. <laughs> you're enjoying life. That's what we call enjoying exactly. life. Yeah. Yes. Why do you look at it like that? Yeah. One of the biggest side effects, though, that I experienced as a result of getting this deep brain simulator is this thing called mania. I get, I still feel like a little bit of it from time to time. But these manic episodes are like these bursts of energy where you feel like so creative. You mm. feel like so like you feel so much like yourself, kind of, but you're not really yourself. You're 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 yourself in overdrive. So okay. I have like these creative bursts where I just want to like draw and paint and like. Like make things in the world but then yeah. i also want to like communicate and like talk to everybody that i, I have ever known throughout my childhood and, like i'd be like calling friends that i haven't spoken to in years like rambling in, into the phone with them it's really like being like a manic individual if you ever yeah. want to see what that's like though there's a movie called the fly starring um what's his name the guy from jurassic park yeah uh, i know who you're talking about you're talking about the one that was in the 80s yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know um, yeah. the scientist from jurassic park yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, the movie's called The Fly. That's the best depiction I've ever seen of what it's actually like to have um to go to go kind of to be manic, to be a manic individual. It's called the fly, if you want to see what that's like. Uh the future. This so this is my own depiction of what I think it's gonna be like in the future. In the past, this is the current system or it's just like a, it's it's basically like a straw that you put through both sides of your brain. Okay. Future, though it's going to be like these gangly lines that you see coming out of the thing, and then it'll enervate the target area much more specific, in much more precise ways. So it's going to be a much more effective, much more powerful tool. And I know a lot of scientists and companies have been working on making these things better. One of the things that they're working on though is they're also working on making shrinking the batteries down to the size of the caps in your head. So I don't know okay. if you can see on here, but I have a little, I have a little hole right there. It's not a hole, but it's like a bump on my head where the cap the dbs is yeah yes 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 yeah so in the future the battery will all be up in here so you, know, you won't need to have the wires through your neck 
or the battery in your chest anymore. It'll all be up, up top at some point. Wow. This is Rune Labs, what Rune Labs is offering to patients right now. Okay. Um, like I said, we're trying to come, we're, we'll be in Canada hopefully by the end of this year, this kind of offering where what, what, what it'll be is, so we have FDA approval now to track tremor and dyskinesia throughout the day as well. So that you can met, you can see what how much tremor, how much dyskinesia you have throughout the entire day, rather than just waiting until you go to the clinic and have that one snapshot in time. So it's on like on the watch. Yes, yes, yes. All you need to you, you don't need to do anything. You just have to wear the Apple Watch. If you have okay. this now, we can download. You can actually download this app for free as well. Strive PD. It's called S T R I V E P D. You can search around the, but it's only through Apple right now. So if you have an Apple Watch and an Apple phone, you can download this. You can start to benefit from this right now as well. And then it's connected to the app that tracks the data. Yes, okay. Exactly. So, so the FDA approval. So from a um, privacy standpoint, when they're tracking this data, is it underneath your name or is it underneath a number? Or is it completely? De it's completely anonymous. So they have no idea who the person is okay. that they're seeing. They're only seeing like these streams of raw data, but they can't connect it to their to the individual. Only you can if you look up your if you look at your um, your own personal that on your phone, then you can, you obviously know that it's you. But they have yeah. no idea who you are back in San Francisco. There's a so, quote that I like to tell all students that I think it's important that students, you're not here to worship what's known, you're here to question it. Um, I love this quote from Jacob Bernofsky. I think it's a very important quote. I, think, I wish more students would, would really embody this kind of quote in, in what they're doing. Can I read it? Like less. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah. it is important that students bring a certain ragamuffin, barefoot irreverence to their studies. They are not here to worship what is known, but to question it. Jacob Bronowski. What is ragamuffin? I have never heard that word before. It means like to, to toss your cares aside. I think uh, that's what it means. I'm not exactly yeah. sure, but I think it's something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great word, ragamuffin. <laughs> that's going to be my word of the week. <laughs> Love it, love it. And then I just finish up with just showing them my books. And I tell them a little bit yeah. about where they can get them. Yeah, those are my books. Uh, if you're up, you can find this. So I believe the first one, Brain Fables, is no longer available on Amazon. But you can still find it if you go to cambridge.com and search for Brain Fables. Um, although it might be still on Amazon, I'm not even sure. But the second book will be available within one month, I've been told. Um, so yeah, continue to look for that. Yeah. And I just ended it there. Yeah. Amazing. Just taking some great screenshots here so I could share it with everybody. There's so much to unpack. Like, no worries, oh my no goodness. Worries. And for those of us that are a little more sciencey nerds that like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that love, love to dissect all the, the information um, to process it and, and bring it down so you can communicate it to better to everyone. That's, that's awesome. And so good. Um, okay. Do you have a specific definition of success with what you're doing? Um, yeah, with every talk, with every kind of public facing thing that I do, if I have just one person reach out to me afterwards and say like, oh, wow, that really inspired me, or I did this differently because of you, something that you said, then that's successful for me. Um, and so far, I've, I think it's happened almost every kind of talk I've given so far. I always have somebody reach out. It doesn't have to be like the next day. Sometimes it's a week later, a month later, sometimes up to years later. I, have, I always run into somebody who tells me about some talk that they attended of mine. And they tell me about how it profoundly changed their life. So that's my definition of success. When I give a talk and, and I get some feedback like that later on. That's amazing. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. Oh, I just... <laughs> Uh, where exactly do you see yourself over the next few years? Like, do you have a, you know, you, you showed the, the one picture of like how it's gonna, the past and how the kind of the brain was and how you see the future of how the brain is and, and it's working. Is that kind of how you see things over the next few years for yourself or, or do you, you know, unfortunately, I think that, yeah, unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be able to benefit from those therapies because, well, actually, I might, but that'll be another surgery um, because you have to see the electrodes taken out and then you need a new one put in. 
Um, and I hope I don't have to do that for a while. Um, yeah. But if I do, then I think that might be my future as well. I think it'll be about 10 to 20 years until like that kind of like, until those kinds of new kinds of probes are actually able to be implanted into real individuals. Um, but I am hoping to help help facilitate the growth of those kinds of things as well. Through some of the work that I do, through my advocacy, there's a lot of companies that I work with as well. So I hope to, um, so I do a lot of work just explaining to them the needs of patients. Yeah. And, uh, but that, I, I'm always in like a weird position though, because like I can only really speak for myself. I can't speak for other people. I know like people have like all sorts of different problems that they're facing as well. And um, I try to like do what I can to like remind these companies that I'm just one person with Parkinson's. I, I can't possibly embody everybody that has this disease. Um, so. No, but you, you are advocating, you are giving a voice to many people who have a low voice, you know, or, or no voice. Um, and that's powerful, powerful work. And I, I love how you have said, just mm -hmm. if I can impact that, that one person and that, that has that rippling effect and you're doing that rippling effect on so many, so many different levels. Um, you know, you, you did touch on at the beginning of the interview about how people need to be the best advocates for themselves. Is there a way that you would explain or urge people to do that specifically? Well, it starts like in all things, really. I mean, it starts with education. You have to, you have to educate yourself to the point where you're comfortable talking with scientists and researchers and doctors. Unfortunately, there aren't that many patients though that have the time or the energy needed to really like delve into the research and try to understand all the various aspects that's going on. You know, you don't have to understand everything, but you need to be able to, to speak on their level to some degree anyway, if you ever want them to come and speak on your level as well. So yeah, yeah. It's about opening up those dialogue, making sure that there's more of those two-way streets between the patient community, the researchers, the doctors, the clinicians, the healthcare staffs, the PTs, like the nurses, the speech language pathologists. OT, I mean, there's so many different specialties that are needed in this disease, and there's not enough crosstalk between all of the specialties as well. So I love that you said crosstalk. So what would your suggestion, and I know that you've already said that you're not the be-all and end-all of everything, but you have a very broad and open perspective of all the different channels of everything that's going on worldwide, which not a lot of all the facilities and doctors necessarily do like they're they're kind of and I don't want to say that all of them are like that but they're often they read the studies they're in their bubble they're in the patients it's not a cross wide variance of talking all the time that open dialogue that you're talking about how would you how would you say kind of what would be from a patient open perspective besides advocating for yourself that the medical care system could better come together to advocate for their patients? Um, it's a big question, <laughs> but it is something that I think about all the time, right? And it does come back to the individual, but from a patient perspective and clinical perspective, well, how would you bridge that gap? I wish more doctors would go and see patients in their home. Ah. More researchers as well. Because I think the, the home life is always very different from what they see in their clinics. Or even what they see when I come and visit them, visit them in their research labs. It's never the same thing. It's never the same effect. I mean, even when I go and see my doctors, there's always like a bit of like performance that I'm kind of doing for them. Um, I don't want them to feel bad. Like they're humans at the end of the day. We're all trying to make each other kind of happy in some way or another. Yeah. And their job is to make me feel better. And if I appear better when I'm facing them, then they feel better about what they're doing. So there's like um, there's a part of it that's always there that I I. I can't help but like just try and tap into it every time I go and see them. But it's important that they understand that this is not the real me kind of thing. Yeah. They, they have to be able to, to, to really understand. Who, and this is why I love my team because they do understand me. I, I see them at events around town. I, I've gone and have beers with them. Like I've gone drinking with some of them as well. They know me as a person as well. I wish more, I wish more healthcare teams were able to have the time and the energy needed to really get out and try and learn who is this person I'm trying to help. What do they need? What do they want? What are their desires? What are their hopes and dreams? I think until like we get to a system that has some way of enabling that, we're always going to fall short in actually delivering that kind of care. That's that's really, really well articulated. Thank you. Um, 
is there, is there like specific kind of questions that you would give to people to say, to advocate for themselves? Um, yes, but again, I mean, it, it depends on how, like your level of education first, like I said, education is the, the bedrock of everything that we're doing here. You need to be educated enough so you can actually get to a point where you feel comfortable talking to, to whoever it might be about like, what's wrong with you. Um, I'm thinking actually about an email I just got because like, I, I get a lot of emails like all day long from people who have this disease or scientists or researchers or, or doctors trying to help people with it. And yeah, it's, it's a tough email. I'm not going to go into detail about what it is, but a friend of mine just, just passed away uh, with Parkinson's. Sorry. Um, it's okay, but like, it, I'm trying to think like, cause like he, he, he's not like a good friend of mine. Like I've only spoken to him maybe two, three times in this past year. Yeah. He, he tried to, he reached out to me a few times, like asking like, what more could he be doing? Um, and I tried to like give him some answers, but I realized that like, I wish there was more that I could have said to him because like, I, I wish like, he could have listened to this talk even because yeah. I feel like it would have inspired him. It would have given him more hope uh, to keep on going, to keep on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. I, I mean, that's not easy. Like it's not easy. Um, it is what it is and it's why I keep on doing what I'm doing yeah yeah uh, is there any specific kind of three pieces of advice or things that you want to kind of touch on and share with people that are watching here either with Parkinson's or without Parkinson's to you know you have a, you have a lot of wisdom and you have a lot of experience and you have a, a lot to share um, that people can take many highlights from um, well, yeah, the first thing is that don't let anybody else define your path for you. Mm, yeah. Always go out and make sure that you're defining it for yourself. Um, don't let anybody, you, if whatever disease you're tackling with, don't just like settle for the fact that, oh, I have ALS or I have Parkinson's and that's that. Whatever it might be, try and define it for yourself. Try and live your best life with this disease. Because at the end of the day, I mean, that's all what all humans are trying to do, really. Live the best life, regardless of the circumstances that are in front of them. Um, and also don't think too much about the future, even though I, 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 I'm a sci-fi nerd, I, I like, I love thinking about the future, I love talking about it, but I, I do live my life day by day. I do think, okay, what do I need to do today to make sure that I have as good a day as possible? So a, that's, I think that's a very important message to keep in mind, is that even though like, we can talk about the future a lot, you have to live your life day by day. So remember that as you go forward. I don't know how many pieces of advice that was, but, but yeah, that was two if you have one more then that's great if not no that's amazing what you've shared thank you my third one would be so make sure that you're healthy so when it comes to health yeah there's a lot of like simple things that you could be doing to make sure that you're living a little bit healthier tomorrow than you are today exercise and eat a good diet i think we all know what that means but it's much harder to do especially in this go 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 world that we live in mm. um yeah, exercise. Make sure you have plenty of aerobic exercise in your life and eat a relatively healthy diet for you, whatever that might be. Try, try, try. But yeah. Amazing, Ben. I just, oh, it's so lovely to see you since I met you in the gym. I always follow along when I can your your story and your journey and your adventures um, with Parkinson's and with educating people. And it's just absolutely phenomenal and amazing. And the fact that you shared your time here with us today is super precious. And, um, thank you so, so much. And I know that, um, the rock study boxing members of undisputed are <laughs> going to thank you as well. And I'm sure we're going to have many conversations over the next, uh, two or three classes <laughs> about your journey and what you've shared here. Um, that's, that's amazing. So, do you have a specific website? I know that um, I'll share your Facebook thing, but is there something yeah, that I have my own, I have my, I have my own, Yeah, I have my own blog. It's tomorrowedition.com, T-M-R-W edition.com, E-D-I-T-I-O-N. That's where I do most of my writing. That's where I do like most of my blogging. Nice. Um, I also have a YouTube channel if you want to follow along there. 
I'm going to be posting actually an interview I did in uh, yeah, at Queens with a doctor who's a very good friend of mine. Her name is Jennifer Sharma. I'll be posting that there soon. I think that was a pretty enlightening talk that we had with one another about because a lot of focus on two things that are very uncomfortable for a lot of people to talk about like death and mm. co- like what happens when your cognition is starting to slip. Mm. Um, yeah, we, 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 we delved into those kinds of subjects as well. Um, and I love talking to her about it. So yeah, look for that interview coming up shortly there. All right. I'll take a look for it and make sure to share it. Um, thank you so much, Ben, for joining us here today and sharing your knowledge and insights and stories and presentation. Um, I look forward to the release of your book <laughs> and diving into that. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and everyone, we don't have uh, anyone scheduled next week for uh, the vlog on Thursday, but you never know what's going to happen because it is an adventure. Um, so thank you again, Ben, for joining us here today and make sure everyone to comment um, what insights did you learn today? What did you take away? And most importantly, share because sharing is caring. So thank you so much. Bye.